All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Monetize Your Message. For those of you who are joining us for the first time, I'm Jesse. This is my business partner, Marie, and we make up North Star Messaging and Strategy. And this show is all about how to take all of that messaging work that goes into every single piece of your business and make sure that it's making you some money. And we are super excited for our guest today, which is Victoria Reitano. She is the Chief Marketing Strategist for Brands, Entrepreneurs, and Influencers. And we are so excited to have you here today, Victoria. Thank you for joining us. Thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Yeah. So I first kind of became aware of you when you joined our Facebook group and you started posting some really epic content. And um, then I started seeing you kind of around other groups and whatnot and just be like, wow, I really need to know this girl. <laughs> like she's doing something right. So we, we actually hopped on a call together to chat and just get to know one another. And it was such a fascinating conversation. It was like, she has to be on the show. So why don't you just kind of start by introducing what you do now and kind of how you got to where you are? Absolutely. Um, so I, most people, my name is Victoria, but most people call me Vix because I have the fix for every digital need. I started marketing brands, entrepreneurs, influencers. Um, we didn't really use the word influencer years ago, but I've been doing this for 10 years. I not only create content, but I also figure out ways to turn it into cold, hard cash because after all, that's what we're all doing, right? Um, and I've been doing that for Emmy Award winning talk shows. I taught Meredith Vieira how to tweet. Um, I I taught, I used to manage Bethany Frankel's website. I was a journalist and I started out by focusing on the ethics, right? What was right, what was correct, and how we were to share in a way that would support our audience instead of detract from the overall message. So for me, it was all about the, the, visibility um, and the truth behind what we were sharing. I did that for a local local journalism organization for a little while, loved it. And then from there, I moved on to you know TV. Um, after I worked in TV for a long time, for about five years, I started my own company. So in 2015, I started Creative X Media to give brands the creative fix. And that's everything from video content to um, marketing strategy to influencer strategy and really just turning it into a machine. <laughs> that's really all it's about. I love that. So I love that you distinguish between brands, entrepreneurs, and influencers. Can you tell <laughs> me a little bit like how you created those categories and what that means for someone who's like, ooh, I don't know if I <laughs> would qualify myself as an influencer or a brand or an entrepreneur or am I all three? Well, so I came up with that mainly for my pricing structure, right? Because not everybody needs the same level of support um, or not everybody needs the same level of support at the exact same time. Um, I think a lot of times when people are building their brands, so I like to say every brand, every person is a brand, but not every brand is a person. So a brand can talk in third person, a brand can talk in the we, um, which always makes me think of Queen Victoria. I don't know, I was like kind of fascinated by her as a kid, you know, the royal we. Um, and then brands could even have a totally different persona. So I think a lot of times when people talk about their brand, they forget that it means so many things. It not only means the services, products, and your area of expertise that you're selling, but it also has to do with a thought leadership campaign. And that's where the influencer and entrepreneur piece kind of flows in. Um, the distinction there is that entrepreneurs make money from services more often than not time for dollars. So that's your coaches, that's your, um, you know, uh, fitness instructors, all those like traditional people like us, right? We make time for dollars. And then entrepreneur, so th that's the entrepreneur piece. Influencers make money off their influence. So influencers, entrepreneurs can be both. Um, and influencers are by default entrepreneurs, but they're not focused on selling products. They're focused on selling an idea, a lifestyle, and kind of like an Insta filtered lifestyle, um, even though Instagram doesn't have to be their primary platform. Um, but yeah, it's, it's a lot of fake, I think. And even if that's what they're living, like nobody looks like that all the time. That's the truth. <laughs> right? Right? I'm glad you made that distinction too, right? Like around, cause I think a lot of people are like, well, I want to be an influencer, but then they're like, I think that's just because I have a certain size audience or I have made it to a certain income level, but like, I really like the way that you're distinguishing it because 
you could actually be making like hardly any money and actually be there on the influencer scale, or you could be making a whole lot, but it's, it's what you're selling. I, I don't know that I've heard that distinction a whole lot. So I really like that. Thank you. You know how I really came up with that? I sat on both sides of the table. So I've worked with big brands to acquire influencers and I've worked to manage influencers to tell them how to talk to big brands. So when you get me, you get like someone who's been on both ends of the objective. And I think that a lot of times too, influencers get ahead of themselves. You know, the magic number on Instagram for to be considered an influencer, and I'm rolling my eyes because it is such a ridiculous thing, is 10,000. Um, that's when Instagram feels you get the swipe up link in your stories. Um, and also that's when it starts to become harder almost to get more followers because you get into this like rotation as you get there and then you get there and it's like, Okay, so I've been at 10.1 for two weeks. Like, what the heck? Um, but I think the piece that we're going to shift into in the influencer marketing space, which is important for entrepreneurs, is that it's going to become, okay, what's your conversion rate? So it's not going to be about what your likes are. It's going to be more about conversions. And that means that you're not going to rely on how many Instagram followers you have. You're probably going to rely on a list, on Twitter, on, Inst on LinkedIn, like on all the things that we're neglecting, you know, everybody's so into Facebook and I think Facebook is a great tool, but all of the services could go down tomorrow. We don't own anything. So if you only put all your eggs in one basket, you're also at their mercy. So a few weeks ago, um, I find this fascinating and I think a lot of people don't think about it. So I'm going to share it. Facebook shut down some of their algorithms because they were talking to each other in a language the developers couldn't understand. Spooky. But what we forget, because we never come back to stories like that, we never circle back, is that that means that they shut down some of their algorithms. So I don't know about you, but across the board, and I've, I've managed clients at all sizes, I've seen a lot of reduction in engagement, in traffic, and, mm -hmm. and in overall like likes and comments and shares. So, and, and while they're working through you know, all of the political pieces as well, that's a lot to consider. Like Facebook has to really overhaul their model so that's going to change how we market there. Um, and people are completely exhausted. So I have a brand that works with dog collars. That brand's still doing well because we only post cute dog photos. <laughs> so, so it's like the savior for us. You know, I used to work on a, this old house magazine was a client of mine while they were transitioning and getting a team in place. And I did all their social. And for them, everybody wanted to listen to that, especially through the election last year and through all the drama that comes from yeah. just bad news, good, whatever you feel, it, it's just a lot, right? So I think people are exhausted. And if you have content that is kind of separate from that business piece, then you can use your influence to, or use it to increase your influence. I love that. And I think that's also where the storytelling piece becomes so important, right? It's not just like we're shouting more business advice into the ether. We're attaching stories to it and attaching meaning to it beyond just like, okay, well, here's a way to ramp up how many people are on your list or to get to that 10.1K Instagram followers. It, there's like, there's more to it. There's depth. Absolutely. And for me, I think it's also about, that's where the brand distinction comes in, right? So let the thought leaders, i.e. the white men, talk on Twitter because <laughs> that's who it is. You know, I, I like, I always say that, like, it's the old men in the room who never wanted to let us talk. That's why we became entrepreneurs. So let them do their thing on Twitter and, and Facebook and all their like thought leader, LinkedIn stuff. And then we get to have the freedom to bring that connection piece in. So I often find that when I can share something a little personal, I did like retrograde tips because I'm a digital expert, right? So talking about Mercury and retrograde with my brand clients, like my Fortune 500 clients, they would laugh at me, but talking about it in the overall story of my personal brand and with my entrepreneur clients, it becomes a source of connection. And we all just really want to make that connection. Um, and we want to turn our brands into like passion brands. So I think that brands have to be a little more uh, constrained when it comes to their content buckets and their storytelling. Whereas entrepreneurs, even if they are a big brand or have made a lot of money, to Marie's point earlier, they get to have a little more fun. So one of the words that kind of stuck out to me earlier when you were talking about your journey um, was about turning all of this into a machine. 
but I also hear like from you, it's, it's about personality and it's about being real and it's about storytelling and, you know, sharing the cute puppy videos or whatever it is. So how do you feel like you strike a balance between um, being super systematic and like very strategic about what you do and what you advise your clients in, but also finding that warmth? Is there like a magic balance? There is, and it's called the ice cream sundae. So this is something that I came up with when trying to explain to people who were three times my age <laughs> at the time. I was 23 years old and I was a digital producer at Live with Kelly and Michael. I had literally turned 24 two weeks before I got the job at ABC. <laughs> yeah. Um, like, because I, I got the job the day after my birthday and then I started two weeks later. So I'm, I'm in there and I'm doing my thing. You know, I am kind of this way all the time and always have been. Um, and I, they were like, well, how much can we share about who we are, right? Th these are big personalities. These are people who have had their brands for years, but really kind of left their own digital destinies up to fate. So I said, well, it's like an ice cream sundae. You start with vanilla ice cream. That's the meat of what you talk about. That's all your stories. And you add on a little sprinkles. Maybe your sprinkles are, um, you know, the storytelling that only you can provide. Or maybe it's the language you use or the way that your brand talks, not only in word choice, but also in voice and tone. Um, and then from there, you add the cherry on top. And the cherry on top is the one thing only you can give your audience. So for me, it was the fact that I got to uh, pet Bradley Cooper's dog, like his actual dog, because he brings it with him everywhere. And then I got to in, like talk about it. I wasn't really, Instagram wasn't so big back then. Um, Twitter was. And also like fun fact, Barack Obama follows me on Twitter from those days. So now that's like my little cherry on top where I'm like, yes, and if you go to Twitter and follow me, and then people are like, wait, Barack Obama follows you? And I'm like, yes. And of well, course, it's because <laughs> he won't follow me because I've been telling a lot of people, so I'm going to jinx it because I'm still like, <sighs> I think like that's a thing. But ultimately, the ice cream sundae piece is the three part strategy because I really believe in three things. If you could do, I mean, how many productivity tips would be seen? Mm -hmm. Just do three things. So if you can just wrap your head around three pieces that make it uniquely you, and everybody loves vanilla ice cream to start. Oh yeah, this is true. I'm like really hungry now. <laughs> like I need, I need some ice cream. <laughs> I, I'm pro food related metaphors. <laughs> metaphors and analogies, all food related. I, I told someone how to build a website once and we didn't have a piece of like code from an old, you know, provider. And I said, well, it's like, you know, if you don't tell me how many eggs you need in a cake. It's not gonna happen. Gonna I love it. <laughs> That's amazing. That's so no, and it's such a good description too. Um, and it ties so well into some of the things that we work on with our own clients, which mm -hmm. is like, you have to have solid content. You have to have value. You have to know what you're talking about. But even once you get to that point, there are a lot of people who are serving up that same sort of content. So then you have to make it your own somehow. And that's where we talk a lot about voice work and things like that, because there are million, there might be thousands of copywriters, for example, but you're the only copywriter who is like you. And so that's kind of the way that we approach our work as well. And I think that that ice cream sundae analogy is just like a perfect way to kind of visualize it and make me hungry. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, it, for me, like it was really about just getting something, you know, because if I said, well, you have to have proper cadence and you have to, mm. again, I came from a journalism background, so I didn't really learn all the fancy smancy marketing terms until an agency scooped me up after I had worked at NBC and built out Meredith Vieira's brand, but, you know, for the digital, for her talk show. But what I noticed was that no matter what buzzword you use, and I actually have a blog on that, buzzwords in your digital strategy, like if that's what your audience relates to, then please use those words. But if your audience is uncomfortable with those words, then why are you doing that to them? Um, you know, and, and I really think that that piece is important when we talk about curation. So to me, I always say content is queen, but consistency is king. So if you can only be consistent once a month and good, like really, really good, then that's your cadence. Of course, do I have a better best practice for you know follower growth and lead generation? Yeah, of course, but maybe you can't do that yet. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's just that you have to find you know the t-shirt that fits your brand and your lifestyle. Like I often say, while I was doing all that crazy stuff, you know, I was in my early 20s, I had no pets. Like I used to literally roll home, order dinner, and then like roll back on the computer. Um, 
my life is very different. Like I built my business in six weeks. I was able to quit my six figure job and that was a huge growth spurt for me, but I had nothing else. So like, I didn't even shower some days, soul cycle work and like Starbucks. That was my life. Um, I, I made choices and I am so grateful for them, but that's not the reality for everybody. So often when I do a lot of these interviews related to tips and tricks, it's like, let's put it into perspective. Let's be honest. Let's be transparent. Like, you know, content too now in today's day and age, there is so much of it, as you said earlier, Jesse, like, so how do we stand out? Well, we stand out by being truthful. Yeah, that's so true. I'm glad you're putting it into perspective too, because yeah, there's a lot of, you know, entrepreneur, single parents out there or whatever. They just got a lot going on, or maybe they are doing it as a side hustle and they're still holding down that job, which obviously takes up a lot of, you know, brain power, not to mention time, but, um, but one thing I think that you said that's important for everybody, regardless of how consistent or, you know, the frequency of that consistency was about kind of speaking their language, your audience. So do you have tips on like actually identifying your audience and then figuring out, hey, these are the buzzwords they're super uncomfortable with. And then these, these are phrases that I love, but also they love and it totally makes sense. Yeah. So um, I often say that I'm a content chameleon because I've written from, I've written as men, women, as brands, you know, so, and you guys know, like when you have to jump into somebody else's voice, once you get into it, you're like, oh yeah, I know exactly what that person would say. Um, but it takes a little bit of time. So often when I onboard a client, I say it takes about 10 days for me to learn your audience. Um, and we can post in the meantime, but those are guest test review posts where it's like, guess what your audience wants, test it out, and then review the data. Um, for me, building out content personas, I used to resist that word so much. And now, like, I used to just be like, these are the people we're talking to. These are our people. Everybody knows who their tribe is, right? And the first person in your tribe, or even if you want to use the word ideal client, which is like a whole other bag, <laughs> I, a whole other, I mean, one of my good friends, and I think you guys know her too, like Lacey, Lacey uh, Sites rather wrote a great post on that today. And I was like, yeah, like it doesn't really matter. So, mm -hmm. um, I think that it's about, sorry, she, my, my Kona is of course, because this is what it's like, right? To work at home and be real. Um, so in terms of building out those content personas, it's about determining what they want, what the audience wants from you, and then what types of content they go to. So if you look in your insights, it'll tell you. Instagram has a great set of insights. Instagram will tell you who focuses on or what time they post, what types of content they like, where they're posting from, so you can get a little bit of location data, and you can learn a little bit more about who they are. Um, and I think that that's a great way to do it. I also do the five W's and an H, which um, is my way of doing everything because I come from a journalism background. She's just, yeah, she's just gonna keep barking. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> so she's gotten herself stuck behind a door, and she has to just deal with it. Um, oh, no. That's what she does, because this is her time. But I'm encroaching on her time. <laughs> Even though she had a long Dare you. I basically have like, you know, an overlord here. Um, <laughs> one pound overlord. Like, you know. So anyway, um, yeah. So I start with who are they? What do they want? Why are they coming to you? Where are they coming to you from? People who are coming to you from Facebook or Instagram are two very different people. Mm -hmm. um, they may be the same person, but their objectives, think about when you go on Instagram or Facebook, your objectives are totally different. Mm -hmm. So they, and Twitter, like t people love Twitter because I love it. I'm verified and I think it's great. But if you don't have a content archive, like I have almost five, six years worth of content that I can pull from. If you're just starting out and you're like, I have three blogs, shouldn't I have a Twitter strategy? No, please stay away. From it will stress you out. Right though? I mean, yeah. you know, like Twitter, Twitter, like we all jump like leapfrogs from the most next best thing. And it's not smart. Stay on your lily pad, stay in your lane. Like mm -hmm. with Snapchat, as soon as Instagram came out with stories, all my clients who were like, you must teach me Snapchat. We're like, shouldn't I just do Instagram stories? I'm like, yeah, I told you to wait. Didn't I tell you? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I told you that you would get something because if, you're, if you've spent all this time cultivating an audience, that's not to say that I don't like Snapchat. I actually, like, I invested in Snapchat because I really believe, which my, I love when my accountant was like, really, you're gonna do that? And I'm like, mm -hmm. I believe in it. Um, I think 
that the audience piece there is what's different. Mm -hmm. So really, and this ties back in nicely, even though it was a roundabout way, um, figuring out what your audience's motive is when they come to you on each platform is the, the best way to do it. And then how you can deliver them something different. Yeah, I think that's such an important conversation right now too, because I do feel like there is a lot of fatigue right now around, especially Facebook, which is where our brand spends the most of its time. We spend the most of our time and there's just a lot, there are a lot of people who are tired and they're noticing those algorithm changes, even if they haven't put words to it, right, they're, right. they're noticing, okay, I'm not getting as much traction or as much engagement. So what needs to change? And it's such an important conversation because I think we, we kind of go down two lanes, right? On the one hand, we're leaping for, for the next best thing. And the other, on the other hand, we really don't want to change what we found that works in the past, even when things change naturally. Right. And I mean, I'm a Facebook ads expert. So I do a lot of Facebook ad strategy where it plays into the organic strategy. You know, you can't just boost a post because Facebook tells you they want you to. Um, that's like your credit card saying that, hey, did you know? I mean, I don't know. I'm sure you've gotten emails like, hey, you have all this extra credit. Why don't you go shopping? It's like, no, no, I don't need to go shopping today. That's not part of my strategy. So, you know, I love when my clients will say, I got this. Should I boost the post? And I'm like, no, Facebook just like needs some money. It's the end of the month. Just like <laughs> if you notice, now you'll notice. Now you're going to look and you'll be like, she was right. <laughs> you do, you yeah, get 25 days from now. I'm going to be like, mm -hmm. yeah, so it's the end of the month. You get more of them. Um, especially if you have like a business account with mm. 10 or 12. Then you like, and I think honestly, sometimes it's my fault because I put them into my business manager and, and you know, Facebook flags certain ones of us as power users. Um, cause we do, we use the pages so much, but you know, I think being resistant to Facebook ads, I've had clients tell me, well, that's not real, but an investment is real, a brand. So, you know, entrepreneurs, you want to make that leap. You have to really start making those boss moves and investing in the advertising for your brand is a boss move. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And so along with the investments comes the, the monetization conversation. So I kind of have two pieces to this based on our earlier conversation, which first is going back to those influencers. Um, Marie mentioned earlier, like this idea of like, you can totally be an influencer and not make a lot of money. And I'm wondering how often do you run into these situations where people have amassed these followings, but then don't know what to do with them or how to monetize that? Yeah, I mean, I definitely come across that, um, mainly because people don't know what a what an influencer campaign is worth, um, or even how to say like, okay, so I have 10,000 Instagram followers, but I also have this list of 1,000 people who, where I have a 20% open rate, or, you know, I have this Twitter list, and like, these are the impressions. So it's about knowing you're getting real cozy with your data. Mm. Um, and if you don't know how to do that, like find a good expert. And I always say the best way to find an expert is to ask them questions outside of what they're talking about. Mm. So if you can ask someone, you know, a hundred questions on Facebook ads and they can answer that. But then you ask them five questions on organic Facebook posts and they're like, well, eh, waffling back and forth. Like they're not really an expert because you should know the platform inside and out. Mm. Um, so I think that's one piece of it. The other piece of it is to understand that there are many ways to opt to uh, monetization. So it may not be cash in your pocket or cash in your bank account, but you know, I don't know about you, but I like getting some free stuff or a discount or like, you know, sometimes it depends on what your goals are. And I think that's where we run into the biggest problem, right? Is that people just want it all, all of the things, but they don't know A, the work that's involved and B, what it actually means to get all of the things. So for example, I'm a writer, right? Like that's one element of what I do. So I blog paid. I get paid to blog. That's because I have a large audience. So therefore I get paid to blog. It's not like I'm getting sent on a private jet for my influence yet, but <laughs> Someday, girl could dream, but <laughs> it does afford me certain things. Um, I also think for my brand in particular, like it, it makes a difference because this year, 2017 was when I focused on my brand because I spent a lot of time building all these other people's brands and then there's only so many hours in the day and so much creative juice. Um, so as I was not building my brand, I would have people say to me, well, did you really build that audience for 20,000 for that brand? Because mm -hmm. you don't have that many followers. I'm like, yeah, cause I didn't want to invest in that. So it's, it's about having an honest conversation about what it takes, what it actually mm -hmm. means, and then how many ways you can monetize it that are not just like an exchange of, 
program for dollars or, you know, uh, like coaching program for dollars or group program for dollars, like get creative with what it means to make money online. I love that. And that was actually going to be, that kind of ties into what my next question was, because a lot of our listeners tend to be service provider entrepreneurs. They would fit into Mm -hmm. that entrepreneur category. So a lot of them have spent time creating service packages around traditional coaching or programs or courses and things like that. And that's great, but sometimes they want to get creative and find other ways to monetize their brand that go beyond sort of what everyone else is doing. So do you have any sort of advice for them? Um, find your five. So I often say, find the five people you want to be like in five years. Uh, so look at like Oprah has been on my list my whole life. Who doesn't want to be Oprah? Like, yeah. Solid, (laughs) solid Um, choice. (laughs) Right? Like, I mean, she, I love, I love her. So Marie Forleo floats on and off that list. Um, for me personally, but basically what I do is look at like the five people that I think my brand could be. And then from there, I rein it into five people who are like me now and figure out ways to collaborate. We all have these massive audiences that are like a little tired of hearing us. So things like this is, you know, this videos, uh, Skype interviews, um, or Facebook live or a podcast. Like I have a podcast where I invite people on the one caveat that I have to that is to make sure that your brand voice and who you are still stands out because you don't ever want to give someone a platform to kind of take away from what you do. Um, you want it to be complimentary. So that's why you find five people instead of like one competitor. Um, mm-hmm. And also too, like, don't worry about your competitors. Like they're going to do their thing. Just find your five and keep your blinders on and move forward. Um, I think another way to be super creative is to license your content. So affiliates forget that that is an opportunity. Um, also, oh, well, entrepreneurs forget that that's an opportunity. Also like this, the affiliate programs, things like Max Bounty, um, and what's another one that's like a really good affiliate? There's a few of them that are really good uh, at different levels of, of how involved you are with that. And I think it's important to really figure out how to make your money work for you. Um, and an affiliate program is a great way to do that because you're just using your influence within reason to promote someone who you also agree with mm-hmm. and, and to get paid to do it. Yeah, I love that. Um that idea about you know narrowing it down to to five people and man if those are five if some of those five people do have an affiliate program or some kind of group program where you could come on as a guest expert and it's complimentary or a podcast you could pitch anything like that such a great opportunity for for collaboration and for expanding your audience outside of its little bubble so i love that the other piece too is like i use entreport right i love entreport can i use every other email system of course but that's the one I like. So when I write a blog about that, I put my affiliate link in. Like even right. SoulCycle. I go to SoulCycle an excessive amount. This is probably the 100th <laughs> interview where I've talked about SoulCycle. We have an affiliate link for SoulCycle. Like find the links, join Amazon affiliates. So many of my one-on-one clients are like, I really want to talk about the things in my purse or in my, you know, my camera bag or whatever. And I'm like, okay, so become an Amazon affiliate mm-hmm. and then you can sell it. Mm-hmm. Why not? Yeah, and again, yeah, yeah. that may be five dollars or ten, but in the end, it all adds up. Mm-hmm. Yes, yes. Yeah. I remember. Um, actually, I. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, and it grows. It grows. Like yeah. you know, maybe it's five dollars this month, but maybe next month it's twenty five dollars, or maybe you get enough to boost that post, which then triples it. Totally. Yeah, it's so true. I um, I actually um, with my husband run a travel blog because for a few years we were RVing full time. And I think I took one day, the RV was in the shop and just like Amazon affiliated all maybe five posts. And all of a sudden we were just like making a few hundred on the side every month. It was so nice, you know? So I think you're right. People forget um, all the different ways. I love that you're so creative with it and that you challenge um, sort of just sort of staying to the norm and, and just doing sort of what everyone's been told is the formula. Right. Um, but the, you know, there's so many ways to be creative about it and to be true and honest to who you are. You know, obviously like in a case like that, focusing on those things where you're, you feel really strongly about it. You know, you love soul cycle. You would be talking about it even if you didn't have an affiliate link. Like those are the kinds of things where you want to be like totally aligned with your passion and also what you do. And then also mm-hmm. with your brand. 
And I think that's where a lot of influencers will lose that conversion piece, right? Because they're like, well, I'm just going to get, for years ago, I worked with a few Vine influencers and Vine before it went into the fiery flames that it did <laughs> in a massive way, dumpster fire. Like that's what it became. So it, they would make so much money, like so much money, six figures for a six second video, which is insane to me. That's like when Instagram first became popular and everyone in the C-suite, you know, in the CEO at the, on the mm -hmm. Fortune 500 companies, they were like, we need some influencers. And I was like, okay, but why? Like, mm -hmm. why do we need them? And oftentimes in my corporate career, that like screwed me because people didn't like that I kept saying, well, it doesn't sound like legitimate to pay a 12 year old $15,000 for a YouTube <laughs> Okay. Like if that's what you want to do with your money, cool. You know, yep. Send like, them to college. <laughs> right, right. Well, but none of them saved any money. I mean, that's the other thing too. If you become an influencer, like have a strategic plan for mm -hmm. out what you're actually going to do with your money because yeah. it will run out. So, Get you know, an it. <laughs> right, right. And like the whole creative piece of it too. Like if you're not really into the brand or you're not really into the creative that they give you, then why are you sharing it? Yeah, so true. And your audience knows. There's so many now that are so over, like, you know, you go to those brands and you're like, oh, it's Tuesday at three o'clock. Are they selling something now? Like it becomes the price is right. <laughs> right. <laughs> totally. Okay. So there's one other piece I wanted to circle back around that you mentioned earlier that I think is really important. And that's the transparency piece. Mm. So there have been a lot of words thrown around <laughs> in this entrepreneur sp space. Um, authenticity is one of them. Genuine is one of them. Transparency is one of them. But I think that a lot of people don't actually like spend time thinking about what that means when right. they say, oh yeah, we want to be authentic. So, or we want to be genuine or we want to be transparent. So from a strategic positioning, like what does that actually look like? So for an entrepreneur, let's just, you know, go there. For a brand, for example, being authentic means owning up to where your products are created. <laughs> and sometimes people are not going to like that. So that is something that most brands won't do. Entrepreneurs have a little more leeway because they're not publicly traded, so they don't have to answer to a board or stockholders or any of that, um, but they do have to answer to themselves. So uh, years ago, I had read some book, um, and then of course I like put my own little VIX on it, and it was create a, a C-suite for yourself. So mm. I, and I'm sure like you guys, I always feel better when I could throw it to somebody else, even if it's somebody else in my own head. So if it's another persona, like that's how Vix created too, because I was like, I want to talk about other people, but I don't want to use Victoria. I want to be somebody else. I want to feel more powerful. Um, so that, that transparency piece is like, I created this brand because this is my why, like, mm. and owning it. Like, I'm not saying that you should, you know, run people under the bus, but I do think that, being authentic from a strategic point of view means deciding what your brand values are and then sticking to them. So if your brand is a charitable brand and then you ignore some charities that are clearly in need, then especially if they're aligned, like let's say you decide you're going to donate 5% of all your profits for a month to a dog charity and instead of, or to like a rescue charity. So instead of donating 5% of all profits, you donate like 5% of the things you won in a certain time period or the influencer piece of your business. Um, JLo actually did that for Puerto Rico. She said, I will donate 100% of my Las Vegas show proceeds, which I think is like nice, right? I mean, mm -hmm. nobody should work for free. I have a whole other issue with content that's being given out for free um, because you should at least give credit. And the other piece with authenticity is that you have to give credit. So how many times mm -hmm. do we see graphics and images floating around the web that we know somebody else created and they didn't give credit to? I, my recommendation from a strategic point of view is to not put your handle because Instagram actually like slows down the engagement if you have too much text. Mm. So I find that it's better to just put the text out into the world. Um, but of course, then that opens you up to people who are going to steal your little images that you've created, what I call quote cards. So if you are a responsible internet citizen, then you will say, I found this here, or I found this on Instagram, or, you know, this person said this. Um, mm -hmm. I think that there's nothing wrong with doing that. And more often than not, if the person is, has a bigger brand, even just a bigger brand than you, it'll give you a lift. So why are you resisting it? Um, and then that other like genuine piece, 
that's that's such a tricky one, right? Because your voice could be genuine to you, but maybe you didn't figure out who you are yet. Um, and I do a lot of work with my one-on-one -on -one clients in that space, especially like when you're transitioning from being a side hustler where you're like, I will legitimately do anything as long as it's somewhat in what I like to do. <laughs> like I used to do anything for content. I literally was like, oh, you want me to write you like a, a made of honest, yeah, like $15. Like, you know what I mean? I basically was like, oh, I'll write you like a funeral speech? Okay, $25. Like, it was basically like, if you want me to write or if you want me to show you how to, if you want me to sit with you and guide you on Facebook, like, yep, this much money. So, and again, I still do a lot of that. Those elements evolved into much more robust and, and clear offerings. But it's really deciding like what you're here for and what you're not here for. I wrote a piece on using the editorial process to set good boundaries. Um, because if you think about it, like when we write, right? Like there's some things that just don't get to be part of the story. Yeah, that's true. It's so true. And weeding through that to find like those core elements of the story is such an important process. Right. And building your brand on a series of brand values is not just something that companies with VC, you know, venture capitalist funding are supposed to do. You know what I mean? Like mm -hmm. the, the social good aspect, millennials are, are right now one of the biggest audiences, um, old millennials, young millennials, whatever you want to call them, like they're all in it. And Gen Z is equally intrigued. Gen Z is what comes after. And Gen Z, which we are now trying to train to do whatever we want, is more interested in, right? I mean, that's what we do, right? That's our job. Like we're trying to guide them along. Um, but now they're more interested in how you solve problems for them. Mm -hmm. So I think that that becomes an interesting conversation because in mm -hmm. order to solve a problem, you have to admit that there's a problem. Mm -hmm. So being transparent, you know, th that's why those DIY videos do so well. Or even Tasty. That's why Tasty from BuzzFeed had such a huge success because things that had been so complicated with Martha Stewart and Julia Child and the Food Network, like cooking a home cooked meal, were brought down to such a normal level that if you could do that, you could take the ice cream sundae instead of using all the buzzwords and make people feel comfortable, have them have that true connection, you're unstoppable. Yeah, that's so true. It's almost like a, an accessibility conversation, right? Mm -hmm. Like, like right. okay, who hasn't been like, oh yeah, I want to be able to do crafts like Martha Stewart and be like that good at it. But most of us are going over to Pinterest and looking at the, okay, where's the 13 step manual where I can like literally have someone walk me through it because I'm not a crafty person. Right. 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 And then go to the Pinterest fails to make you feel better and <laughs> right. it ends into a pile of goo. <laughs> right. right. And then find the DIY blog that gives you the exact breakdown of what you should have bought. Yes. yes. Five minutes, done. <laughs> right. And, you know, this is something I think with content, because we give away a lot of content, right? Like we, um, you know, we, we all write content that's also gated by either a program or a paywall or whatever, but those pieces that you give away for free, like it's not going to damage your integrity. Giving a giving yes. is going to be a good thing because you're going to show that you know, yes. you know, yeah. you're going to show that you are the expert that you say you are. And also that like, you're not a robot. I think people really want that more than anything else. They want people to have a huma humanity. Yeah, and I feel like that also plays so much into that like almost millennial Gen Z conversation of like we are a kind of bracket of people who say prove it a lot. Yep. Like we don't just take things at face value. Like, oh, you say you're an expert at blah, blah, blah. Well, obviously you are because you said you were or because right. you have a degree or something like that. Like we're like, no, I want you to actually prove it. Like right. show me the work that you've done in this area. Show me the testimonials. Show me the, the products. And your you process. Could, mm -hmm. Absolutely. You could tell people all day long what to do. And you could tell them about case studies and you could tell them about testimonials. But if you actually show people how you do it, mm -hmm. whether yeah. it's through a conversation or like the actual making of something, I mean, that just changes the game. And I, and I often find that it, it also removes the intimidation factor because that's mm -hmm. what people really mean when they say they want to be authentic. They mean that they want to be approachable, um, but they just felt like authentic was the buzzword du jour. And it'll go away. It will. Like, yeah. You know, right now we're on this big kick where we're using the word misinformation, which I, I think is a valued, a valuable word in, in mm -hmm. the current space we're in. People can manipulate everything. So, you know, take a minute to look at an image before you share. Like, no one thinks before they share anymore. And that's what's ruining it for all of us. I, I wrote a post about how marketing has a problem because marketing is now subject to all the other issues with social media shares. So once, once you poison 
a water source, right? Like it's not good for anybody. Mm -hmm. So if you're sharing content that's wrong or improperly sourced or curated from a bad source, then everyone on that network becomes afraid. And then it's no longer a viable fishing ground. Yeah. yeah. So true. So true. <laughs> Super true. And I love that you, you know, you come from that ethics background and I can feel that that colors, you know, a lot of your perspective and, um, you know, it's that moment where you're like, okay, maybe I am just an entrepreneur and the only person I have to answer to is myself. But you know, if I'm ruining it for myself and for my business, that's for the audience, it's for other entrepreneurs in a similar space. Um, and just asking yourself that question, like, okay, if I were publicly traded, like, would I be behaving this way? You know, be behaving this way? Just like check, whatever it is to check in with yourself, whether it's sharing something without, you know, attribution or yeah, sharing something before checking it. You're right. That's huge right now. It's a huge problem. And you know, it's funny, all my friends in the journalism space, because I still have people who are on the right side, they often say to me, well, you went to the dark side. And I say, no, <laughs> now I get to guide the conversation. Now I get to make true change because journalists just have to stand at the sidelines and tell you the facts. That's what we're trained to do. Whether it looks like that or not has so many other factors and it's a whole other conversation. But as people, we're trained to pull our emotions out of everything and say, this is what happened on such and such a day. Like we have a formula, but when you're a marketer, you're meant to hit somebody's emotion. So there's not always ethics there. So my mission in this world is to remind people that no matter whether you make a thousand dollars a month, $10 a month, or a million dollars a month, you have a responsibility to be a good citizen of the internet. I love yeah. that. It's so powerful and so needed, I think, because it's also one of those things that you establish early on, right? Like yeah. if you, you start by having strong ethics and strong character and saying, this is what I believe in as a person and as a brand. And then that's going to carry you all the way through, all the way from $10 a month up to whatever you want your business to become. Absolutely. And that money piece, I know we're a little bit over, but that money piece is like, you know, the six figure conversation makes me crazy. Like I live in New York. If I didn't make six figures, I would literally be living in a box. Like the six <laughs> figures is, is basically $30,000 here. Like I know that that also yeah. is preferably and sounds ridiculous and someone will probably be mad about it, but yeah. it really like, <laughs> I live in LA. She lives in LA. <laughs> like I'm sure somebody's going to twinge out. It's cool. Like whatever. You can see my books. I spend way too much money on SoulCycle and Starbucks. <laughs> <laughs> and my very fresh French bulldog, like gets a lot of that money too. Cause she goes to camp. Um, but you know, for me, it's like, if you don't want to make six figures, that's fine. Like, there's nothing wrong with that. But my goal in life is to make way more than seven, like multiple seven, right? So that's my goal. But I didn't want to have to talk about how much money I made because in my mind, that has nothing to do with how well I can market your brand or how well of a, or how good of a job I can do for you. Like, but I noticed when I personally started to share my income with entrepreneurs, I got more bites. Because they felt hmm. like, well, this is proof. This is legit. Yeah. And I was like, what? Yeah. Like how much money I have in the bank has anything to do with. So I really want that conversation from, a, from an entrepreneur perspective, because I am so many brands in one, um, to really change. I want to move that conversation to like, what do you really want out of this? Is this like something that you want to use? You know, I started freelancing, side hustling to just earn more SoulCycle classes. That's all I wanted. I just wanted to be able to go to SoulCycle or like some other ridiculous $35 plus gym class and not feel like I couldn't do it or buy my $13 juice generation breakfast back in the day when I wasn't cooking for myself. Like, that's all I wanted. So, you know, and, and to pay off student loans and like, you know, all those things were important to me. And they still are, but they have shifted, right? Like now mm -hmm. I want to use money to build the business. And I think, when we talk about money, we don't talk about it in an authentic way. We talk about it in like a, you know, I must hit those rings way. Um, and that's where you start to, to get into trouble, I think, with what it is, what it should be. You know, shoulds, I always say shoulds are BS. Like, you should just stop. You, sh you can't say should. Like, I really try to use any other word except for that. I really yeah. do. It's hard. It's hard. Um, but our words have power. Like, you guys, I think, get that more than anybody else um, because you know use use words for good or for bad like you have to really think about what would spider-man do like 
<laughs> yeah, no, um, we did an interview a few months ago with uh, Kimbo and Bliss and her kind of one of her catchphrases is should is shit. Oh, and I like that. <laughs> like, yeah, it's the same thing. It's like, like you can't should yourself to death. Um, and also like the number conversation that can't, you can't just like throw arbitrary numbers on your goal sheet and be like, I want to be a seven figure entrepreneur because I want to be a seven Reasons. figure entrepreneur. <laughs> Right, right. Because, <laughs> Why? What does that mean? So stupid. And you know, I mean, even like, what does that mean for your life? How much does that mean a month? And like, what is it? And also my favorite part of that conversation is, is that money in your bank or did you book that? Or are you mm -hmm. anticipating that? Is that projected yeah. or yeah. banked? And like, can you even spend it? Like, can you look at that money and like allocate it out to different things? Or are you left with like this chunk afterwards? It's like, eh. It's there because I made it and that therefore I feel awesome about myself now. Yeah. Or alternately, right? Like a lot of people will just spend to make it. And so at the end of the day, they have the exact same income as they had when they were making like 50,000 a year. Right. Right. And you know, I mean, for me, it's like, it, it just has to be, you have to be more connected to your story so you can be more connected to your goals. And I think that's why I really came up with the brand entrepreneur and influencer, because for me, there's my brand, there's my goals as an entrepreneur, and then there's like stuff I want, cool stuff I want to do as an influencer. And I have the opportunity in today's day and age to do all three. Um, and that's why I quit my job because I couldn't do the entrepreneur or the influencer conversation if I was still working for a brand that, that gagged me. Um, and I've worked for a lot of brands like that, like retweets don't equal endorsements, but sometimes, you know, they do. And, and sometimes people perceive that. So you really just have to think about what you want and why your why is the only thing that really matters because it's yours. Yeah. It's so true. Well, we've gone way over because we can't get, no, no, we just can't get enough. Um, your um, clients are obviously in amazing hands with you. And for any of our listeners who want to learn more about you, where can they find you? So you can go to Vix in the city on any platform. Um, I will accept DMs. I will accept carrier pigeons, um, whatever you want. And my blog is Vix in the city. That's my personal lifestyle blog, but the business is creativexmedia.com. Perfect. Awesome. And we will definitely link to those in all of the show Thank notes. Thank you so much. Thank you for joining really us. Pleasure. I appreciate it. This has been so Thank much you. fun. Thank and you. And tell uh, Barack Obama hi for us. <laughs> I never tweeted him. I'm so afraid that they'll remember that they did it by accident. <laughs> I love it. All right. Well, <laughs> this has been fun. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you.